It was just after midnight when 17-year-old Brian Kring pulled up to the Burger Chef in Speedway, Indiana. And normally, he would have been inside flipping burgers, but he was off that night and thought he would help some of his pals close up. He parked behind the restaurant and noticed the back door was open. He walked through it to find the place empty. There were no co-workers wiping down tables. There was no one in the back prepping for the next day. He thought maybe they're all in the walk-in freezer, so he shouted, but there was no answer. The only noise was the hum of the kitchen equipment. All four of them were gone. When he checked the manager's office, he saw something that really scared him. The safe was wide open and the cash drawers were laid out on the floor. A few empty money bags and a used up roll of tape sat nearby. So he called the police and what happened next jump-started one of the most notorious cases in the country. Hi, I'm Chris and thanks for watching True Crime Recaps. The first officer on the scene took down the missing employees' names for the police report. Daniel Davis and Mark Flemons, both 16, Ruth Shelton, 17, and the assistant manager, 20-year-old Jane Fright. The store manager arrived shortly after that and verified a total of $581 was also missing. All in all, it didn't even add up to grand theft. In fact, at the beginning, it hardly seemed worth investigating. They figured the workers made a grab for the cash and ran off. They'd turn up sooner or later, right? Wrong. There was more to it than money. Among other things, $100 worth of coins was left behind, and so were the women's purses and jackets. Moreover, the store manager didn't think these were the type of kids who would pull this kind of stunt. They were all pretty responsible employees, the last people you'd expect to steal money, let alone leave without fully closing up shop. But a scenario more sinister than petty theft was unthinkable. So, they didn't think about it. The officers gave the employees a green light to go ahead and clean up. Burger Chef opened the next day as usual. Not one crime scene photo was snapped, no fingerprints were dusted for. But even as the crew went on about their business that Saturday morning, police noticed Jane Fright's abandoned car a few minutes south of the store. That was the clincher. This didn't look good. Then Sunday rolled around. That afternoon, an elderly couple hiking through the woods in the next county over found Jane. Someone had stabbed her to death so violently, the blade broke off in her body. And to this day, the handle has never been found. Ruth and Daniel were nearby, and their bodies were face down on the ground, shot through the back. Mark wasn't far away. He had been beaten with a metal chain. And some of the officers speculated he might have been able to make a run for it at some point during the attack, then collided head first with a low-hanging tree branch, which would have knocked him out. Given the way he fell, the blood from his injuries would have naturally pooled into the back of his throat while he was unconscious, which eventually would have drowned him. None of the employees were hard to identify. All four were still wearing their brown and orange Burger Chef uniforms. The woods were about 30 minutes from the restaurant, and other isolated places were readily available along the way, but the killers deliberately chose that spot. All things considered, the police thought the people they were looking for were probably more familiar with the woods than Speedway, where they were kidnapped. Surprisingly, the bodies still had cash and other valuables on them, and that made it increasingly evident that whatever happened that Friday night did not have anything to do with money. There may have been clues in the second crime scene that could have helped them figure out what was going on. Unfortunately, it was also compromised and ruined, leaving them with very little to go on. They were pretty sure they were looking for more than one suspect. After all, it would be increasingly hard for one person to keep four hostages in line on their own. And the fact that they were killed in different ways with different weapons backed up that theory even more. But did that mean the killers showed up to Burger Chef with murder on their minds? The cops didn't think so. They thought it was more likely they were there for a different reason, but for some reason, the plan changed. Maybe because one of the employees recognized them. Remember Brian Kring, first on the scene? He had been on a date that night, and he stopped at the restaurant after he dropped her off. Mark Flemons was covering that girl's shift, and he wasn't supposed to be there that night. Maybe Mark was an unwelcome surprise. Then, feeling trapped and in a panic, they took everyone hostage. That was just one idea, and truth be told, everyone had a theory. Maybe it was the work of a gang robbing fast food restaurants in the area. 
Maybe somebody working that night was indebted to the wrong kind of person. Maybe they were looking at the work of the Speedway bomber who had terrorized the town a month earlier. As it turned out, a few of those theories may not be too far off. Some investigators have even gone so far as to say this case was solved, they just couldn't prove it. Eight years after the brutal mass murder, a detective got a lead. Donald Forrester was a twice-convicted rapist looking at 95 years in the state's most brutal prison, and he wanted to make a deal. He claimed he was the man who had shot Daniel and Ruth. He said he and his buddies went to the restaurant for Jane, and her brother owed the wrong person, so they started leaning on her. Then, Mark stepped in. From there, the situation spiraled out of control. At some point, Mark fell and hit his head on the bumper of their van. Now, they thought he was dead or dying, so they took the other three employees to cover up. He had the other suspects' names to bargain with if they were interested, and they most definitely were, but before they got too excited, they put him to the test. He passed with flying colors. At the time in question, he'd been in living in Speedway, but originally he was from the county where the bodies were found. And according to the Indianapolis Monthly, not only did he lead them straight to the murder scene, but he went on to describe exactly where and how they'd been positioned. His ex-wife corroborated his story. According to her, a few days after the murders, he took her up to that same remote area. At one point, she remembered him wading into the creek to fish out a couple of shell casings. When they got home, he flushed them down the toilet. Now, that lead took them to his former house, or more specifically, the septic tank. After wading through the swampy cesspool, the detective found what he came for. Three shell casings from a thirty-eight, The same bullets that had been found in Ruth and Daniel's bodies. He even knew some facts about the case that hadn't been widely released, like the fact that the knife handle was missing. And his story about a knock to Mark's head explained why some of his injuries were a few hours older. It was beginning to look more and more like Donald was the key to cracking this case. But just like that, it all fell apart. When word leaked that he was talking, he recanted his confession altogether. Despite the shells they found and his compelling story, it wasn't enough for conviction. So the prosecutors and investigators were left with a bit of a dilemma. Should they continue pursuing a man that already had a 95-year sentence, especially when they knew they probably couldn't convict him for this, or should they focus their energy elsewhere? In the end, they decided not to charge him, and eventually cancer killed him in prison in 2006. But with him went the truth of what may or may not have happened on that chilly November night. Or maybe it didn't. Other people close to the case say Donald was just looking for a sweetheart deal to avoid doing hard time. They think another theory is closer to the truth. There was a group of men going around robbing similar businesses in those days. The gang typically got in through the back door around closing time, when employees would be taking out the garbage for the night. Around the time of the initial investigation, a witness described two men hanging around the restaurant close to the time of the murders a bearded man, and a man with light-colored hair. Then another tip came in, a big one. A man was bragging about the crime. A plainclothes detective cozied up to him at a local bar to find out what he knew. As it turned out, he didn't know much. He gave them some names, but the big break came when they checked them out. As they were driving in one suspect's neighborhood, they happened to see a man who looked like the bearded guy they had been looking for. But the night before they brought him up for a lineup, he shaved his beard, and no amount of coaxing or bargaining could make him confess or turn on anyone else. They eventually tracked down a man they thought could have been the light-haired guy, but he wouldn't budge either. So, they were left right where they started. But, as time marched on, death came to claim three of the five men they were eyeing. One was murdered, one committed suicide, and one died of a heart attack. And now, only a confession or hard evidence can answer the questions that continue to burn. Who is responsible for the deaths of these four young innocent kids, and why? Was it all about money or drugs, or did something much darker play a part? What do you think? Weigh in down below, but don't go away. More crime in half the time is coming right up, right now in this next recap. Remember to subscribe and tap the bell so you never miss a story. Until next time, take care. <laughs>